Amen. You may be seated. Before I get started, um, tonight uh, at 6 p.m., we will be here, right here in this building, in this room. And uh, we're going to be licensing uh, Brother Brad Vaughn to, uh, to the gospel ministry. Um, he's been, he's finished, his, got his seminary degree, he's been following the Lord, he's been serving the Lord for several years now, uh, but tonight we're going to actually, uh, he's going to bring this evening's message, and uh, so I just want to encourage any of you who would to come and be a part of that, It'd be a great opportunity to, to hear from God's Word, from hear uh, from uh, somebody else from God's Word, and it'll be a great opportunity to support Brad and his family and his is uh, following the Lord into, into the ministry. Um, me and my wife had the, the privilege this weekend of going to a, a, marriage, uh, a marriage retreat for pastors and, and their wives. Uh, whether you know this or not, we pastors and, and, and our families uh, have, have messed up. Our marriages can be just as messed up as yours are too. So uh, we, have to, we have to go for retreats, we have to get help, we need counsel, we need leadership, we, uh, we, need, we need help like, like anybody does. I, but I got to hear this great, uh, this great story uh, this week uh, that I, I just thought I'd share to you. This, uh, somebody came up to this man who had, who had just had his 60th wedding anniversary, and, and they asked him, they said, how... Did you manage to stay married to the same lady for 60 years? And he thought for a second, and he was just trying to, he, he, he was kind of puzzled trying to figure out, well, what is it? How did I stay married for 60 years? And then, and then he realized, he said, it goes back to my honeymoon. And the guy said, your honeymoon, really? He said, yeah, after, my, after we got married, we went on a trip, and on that trip, we went horseback riding. And while we were uh, while we were horseback riding, I was I was on one horse, my wife was on the other, and and I noticed that that her horse stumbled, and she stuck her finger her, her finger in there and said, "That's one." And I thought to myself, "What what's that all about?" But I wasn't going to say anything. Just trying to figure it out. Well, uh, they go a little bit farther, and the horse stumbles again, and she says, "That's two. And he's like, "Man, what?" What's going on here? And then he goes a little bit longer and, and stumbles. The horse stumbles again and almost falls this time. She says, that's three. She gets off. She pulls a pistol out of her handbag and she kills the horse. And, the guy, and, and her new, new husband said, what do you think you're doing? You can't just kill the horse. And she said, that's one. Now, there's probably a lot of good lessons from that, but the greatest lesson that I could think of is make sure your wife doesn't have a pistol <laughs> in her handbag. Uh, why, why a series about, about marriage? Why is, that, why is that even important for us? And, 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 and the first reason, I guess I'd say the most important, one of the most important reasons is the fact that, that that marriage is uh, is under attack. We have an enemy who who hates uh, Christ and he hates marriage and he hates families. He hates it when families work the way they're supposed to work, and and when and he hates it when people uh, are, are are building and strengthening and making godly families. But here's the here's the reason why I believe a, a series on marriage is important. And if you're taking notes, this is, this is it. Marriage is more important than you think. Marriage is more important than you think. It's more important than you can even imagine. And so today, what I want to do is I want to talk about really what's at stake here. I mean, what's at stake if marriages don't work? What's at stake if things aren't going the way they're supposed to go? What's at stake if the traditional view of marriage goes away? And by the way, let me just let, me just let you know that, that the purpose of this message and the purpose of, of this series is not, is not specifically and it's not focused on trying to tell you, tell you why same-sex marriage is wrong, Okay. We'll see when we look at a definition of marriage about, about where that fits in. But that's not really even my main goal. 
But see, one of the first things that we need to do if we're gonna if we're gonna decide, if we're gonna understand why marriage is so important and see how marriage is more important than we can really imagine or we even think, is we need to start by having a definition of marriage. And as, and as Christians, as people who follow, who obey God's word, who are seeking God's word, we also come from, we really come from it from a, another, uh, another angle. And that is this. I don't believe that it's our responsibility, and you shouldn't either, believe that it's our responsibility to define marriage. What we do is we discover God's definition of marriage. That's the reason why we, why we go to God's Word. So if you've got your Bibles, look with me in Matthew chapter uh, 19. Matthew chapter 19. And uh, that's on page 905 if you, if you want to use one of those pew Bibles. Matthew chapter 19, we're going to begin in verse 4 in just a minute. Let me give you just a, a, little, bit of, a little bit of background to this. Jesus has just left Judea, which is where his, his ministry was focused at, where he lived at during his, most of his ministry time. He's left Judea, and he's go, or I'm sorry, he left Galilee, and he's going down to Judea. And the reason he's going to Judea is because it's time for the, uh, it's time for the festival. Uh, and, and he's actually going to end up being uh, arrested. And he's going to end up being uh, tortured and crucified and all, and all that kind of stuff. And then finally he rises from the dead three days later. So he's making his last trip from Galilee down to Judea. And while he's going, he has all these, these crowds that are following him. And he's healing the people in these crowds. He's, uh, he's teaching the people in these crowds. He's doing all these, he's, he's just doing ministry with these people in the crowds. And, and then one day, this, this, or these Pharisees come up, these, these religious leaders of the day come up, and they ask Jesus a question. And Matthew tells us here in Matthew 19, the reason they ask the question was because they were trying to catch Jesus in making a mistake. Because they wanted to find a good reason to arrest Jesus. So the, here's the question that they asked. Is it really, does, does the law of Moses really say that it's okay to divorce your wife for any and every reason? I mean, can we really divorce for, for any reason? What do you say, Jesus? So here's Jesus' reply. In Matthew 19, beginning in verse 4, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife on any grounds? Verse 4, haven't you read? Let's stop there for a second. Haven't you read? Do you, you know what Jesus is doing here? He's taking them back to the Old Testament. In other words, he's, he's submitting to the authority of God's Word. This, this is, now, this is, this is the Son of God, but we also understand the Bible tells us that, that Jesus left behind much of his attributes and his, his, the, the things that he should have had and should have kept to himself as God. He left those things behind, left them in heaven. And he came down to walk, walk, earth, walk on earth as a, as a human being the way, the way we do, to, to struggle with many of the same things and, and to have the temptations of many of the same things that we're tempted with. And so what does Jesus do? He, he goes back to God's word. For us as Christians, we need to follow his example in this. We need to always submit to the authority of God's word. We need to say, what does God say about this? What does God want me to do? What would God, how would Christ want to handle this? So let's, let's keep going. He says, verse 4, Haven't you read, he replied, that he who created, who created? Yeah, that's right, God. God, God created. He who created them, that's the man and his wife, in the beginning made them male and female. And he also said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. 
Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. So here, we discover Jesus' definition for marriage. Now, I am going to oversimplify his definition of marriage, okay? I'm, I'm going to say it in as simple way as I possibly can. And then I'm not going to try to unpack it at all, okay? Because I just want us to see what his definition is. And so, here's Jesus' definition of, of marriage. Are you ready? If you're taking notes, there's a place for you to take notes on this. One man, one woman, one flesh for one lifetime. That's, a, that's simplified. We can say a whole lot more about that. You're going to find great preachers. I was listening to something by Dr. David Jeremiah this morning, and he had a really long definition, which is which is much more, which is which says a lot more than this. But this is simplified. This is Jesus' def- definition of marriage: one man, one woman, becoming one flesh for life. That's it. Now, Jesus' definition complicates things in this life. I'm aware of that. I'm aware of this whole... Because he's talking about divorce right here. I'm I'm aware of his definition of this thing about one life. Really, really makes things difficult in making decisions and in, 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 in having strong marriages and being able to stick too strong. I, I'm aware of the, the complications that are involved there. I'm, I'm aware of the complications that, that this, this, this culture and this society that we live in finds and, 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 and ignores when Jesus says, one man and one woman. I'm aware of the complications that are there. But, but Jesus just doesn't give an option here. He doesn't leave this, this definition. He doesn't leave it up to the couple to decide what marriage is. He doesn't leave it up to the government to, dis- to decide what marriage is. He doesn't lead, leave it up to the individual to decide what marriage is. Jesus just does what we need to do. He goes back to the Old Testament, and, and which, which is important because that means he goes to the place where God created marriage. And if there is a God whom we believe in, then he has the right to create it how he wants to. So Jesus' definition complicates things in this society, in this world. And frankly, Jesus' definition complicates things for us as Christians as well. You know why why it makes things complicated for us? Because in a lot of ways, we as Christians conform to the world. In a lot of ways, we end up doing things the way the world does them. That's why it's important for us to know what Jesus says. But you know what this means? This means that marriage is more important than you think. I mean, for Jesus to talk about this this way, with such clarity, has to mean that marriage is more important than we think. So let's keep going. Now there's lots of, there, there's lots of, there's some obvious reasons for marriage. Procreation. For, for raising raising kids, uh, you know, parents having having a mother and a father, uh, uh, the deepest level of sexual fulfillment. I mean, marriage has lots and lots of of really important purposes, but marriage actually goes deeper than that. So now, look in the book of Ephesians, chapter five. Ephesians chapter five. I believe that was on page one thousand and seventy four. In your pew Bible. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to begin in verse 22. Now Paul is writing. Paul the apostle Paul wrote a letter to Christians in Ephesus. And in this letter he said lots of really really cool. Lots of important things about living the Christian life. But I just want to read one portion of this letter that Paul wrote. In the book of Ephesians. And and it's the portion that's about marriage. There's a lot of stuff that he says about marriage in this passage of Scripture. And I'm not even going to try to talk about most of it. Because there's one important point that I want us to find in here. Because Paul is going to give us an, the ultimate purpose for marriage. So in Ephesians chapter 5, let's begin in verse 22. Wives, 
Raise your hand if you're a wife. Okay. Raise your hand if you may be a wife one day. Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever been a wife, think you might be a wife, or currently are a wife. Okay. I saw some of, I saw some of you ladies who are married now not raise your hand. I'm not sure what that means. Wives, submit to your own husbands. As to who? As to the Lord. Verse 23, he says, why? For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Verse 25, husbands, husbands, raise your hand. Okay? If you hope to be a husband, possibly might be a husband one day, raise your hand. Alright? If you ever were a husband, are currently a husband, or might be a husband one day, raise your hand. Listen to what he says, husbands. Love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or anything like that, but holy and blameless. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, since we're members of his body. For this reason, verse 31, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. Verse 33, to sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself and the wife is to respect her husband. So Paul tells us something about marriage right here that we need to let sink in. Paul gives a purpose for marriage right here that we, again, we don't always think about this. This isn't like something when we think about marriage, this isn't the first thing that comes to our mind. In fact, when, when I first got married, um, I didn't know this. I had never been taught this. I never, I never saw this. Not that my preachers may not, my preachers growing up may not have said it, but... I didn't listen. But he's telling us something about marriage that's important for us to know. And the ultimate purpose of marriage is this. The ultimate purpose of marriage is the glory of Christ. The ultimate purpose of marriage is to point to Jesus Christ. It's to reflect who Christ is. That's the, that's the ultimate purpose of marriage. Well, what about procreation? Well, that's important too because God did say be fruitful and multiply. What about raising a good, strong family? That's important too. Well, what, what about having, having somebody to help me? Well, that's important too because God did kind of say it's not good for man to be alone, so he created, created a helper. That's important. But what about happiness? Isn't marriage about happiness? Listen, marriage brings lots of joy. It brings lots of happiness. But it also brings lots of hardship. Marriage is not for wussies and sissies. Okay? Marriage is for big boys and big girls. Why? Because marriage is hard. The ultimate purpose of marriage is not your happiness. The ultimate purpose of marriage is the glory of Christ. It's to point people to Christ. So what I want you to see right here is I want you to look at six comparisons that it makes, that, that Paul makes. Look at these comparisons. First of all, in verse 23, he says this, As Christ is the head of the church, so the husband is the head of the wife. As Christ is the head of the church, so the husband is the head of the wife. In other words, just like Christ is the head of the church, the husband acts the same way towards his wife, or the wife acts the same way towards her husband. 
Number two, as the church submits to Christ, so the wife is to submit to the husband. In other words, when the wife submits to the husband, she's pointing towards Christ. And she's pointing towards how the church submits to Christ. It points towards Christ. Third, as Christ sacrificially loved the church, so the husband is to sacrificially love his wife. So when a husband makes sacrifices in order to minister to, to care for, to love his wife, what does that mean? It points towards how Christ sacrificed his life on the cross for our sins. You see, marriage points to Christ. Marriage is about the glory of Christ. You see, marriage is more important than you thought. It was, it was, it's, more, it's more than happiness and it's more than procreation. Look at number six. As Christ cherishes his church, so the husband is to cherish his wife. In other, in other words, when a, when a husband loves and cares for and treats his wife as if she is the most important person in his life, that points towards the way Christ treated you. Do you remember the, do you remember the, the parable Jesus told of the lost sheep? Do you remember how in that parable Jesus tells about this this? Uh, this uh, shepherd who had a hundred sheep one of them got lost and he left the 99 uh, in, a, in, a, in a safe place and he went to look for the one you see that's a picture of Christ's love for us that he cares about us so deeply he cares about you so deeply that were you the only person who needed to be saved he would have died for you why is that? It's because that's sacrificial love. That's real love. That's the kind of love that Jesus has for us. Next is the church. This is from verse 31. As the church leaves one relationship for Christ, so the spouse leaves their relationship with their parents for the husband. I think I messed up a word there. As the church leaves one relationship for Christ, so the, spouse, the spouses leave their relationship with their parents for one another. As Christians, when we, become, when, when, we, when we see how deeply Christ loves us, and when we give our lives to Christ, we no longer can be friends with the world. James chapter 4 tells us that, that, we, that we can't be friends of the world and friends with God. 1 John chapter 2, 15 tells us that you can't love the world and the things of the world because if you love the world and the things of the world, then the love of the Father is not in you. Now that doesn't mean you can't have friends who are, who are people in the world. He's talking about something much deeper than that. You can't, you can't, you got to have friends who are in the world because you can't be an evangelist. You can't share your faith with Christ. You can't disciple people unless you've got friends who are in the world. So what he says is, is, is we see a picture here of Christ. The same way that I left my parents and I've clinged to my wife. So we leave the, our old self and we leave the world and we cling to our new love. We cling to our greatest love, Jesus Christ. And then finally, as the church becomes one with Christ, so the husband becomes one flesh with the wife. Now this is, this is so deep, this is so awesome and, I, and we can't talk much about this, but this is huge because do you know how you were able to enter into the presence of God? Do you know how you're able to have a relationship with God? Do you know how you're able one day to go to heaven and spend an eternity with God? It's not because of anything you've done. 
The reality of it is, is that when, when I walk or when you walk into the presence of God one day, it's going to be for one reason and one reason only. It's because, it's because He's going to see the blood of Christ covering you. You see, we have been become one in that death, in the burial, and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're united with Christ that way. So when, when a husband and wife come together, the, God created it in such a way that we become one flesh. So that no longer, uh, no longer is, it, is it two people sharing one thing. You see, when I got married, it was, it was a rude awakening for me. I had no idea I had to share my movies with my wife. I mean, I expected to have to share my bed, but my movies? You see, it's not that we share anything. She has her stuff, I have my stuff, and, and it's that now we're one flesh. What belongs to me belongs to her. What belonged to her belongs to me. We're one flesh. And when that works, when that works right, and it doesn't always work right, I understand that, but when that works right, guess what it does? It points to Jesus. You see, marriage is more important than you think. And if marriage is, is that important, if, if marriage is about pointing to Christ, if marriage is about glorifying Christ and about helping people see Jesus in our marriage, then, then it's more important than we, than we ever realized and we could ever imagined. Then it does matter who we marry. I mean, if, if, our marriage, if, if marriage is really that important, then it does ma- matter if we're a Christian and we choose to marry a non-Christian. If marriage is really, really is that important, then it, then it does matter if we, if we end up trying to, to get a divorce. And let, let, me, let me just say something here real quick, because this is so important. I know that every single one of our lives and, and many of our marriages have been touched in one way or another by divorce. I know that. And, and the, point, the point of this message and the point of any of this is not to, 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 to throw guilt or to, shoot or to throw rocks at you. Or, or any, it's, it's not that. The point is to help us to see God's purpose for marriage. Because you see, marriage is more important than we think. And let me say this, we serve a great God who can redeem us. Who can take the, the mistakes that we've made or the things that we've done and he, can, and he can make, well frankly, He can make lemonade out of it. He can do great things. But see, if marriage is that important, then it deserves our time to think about it. But let me ask you a question here for just a second. You think Christ would ever let you go? You think there's anything that you could do to come to Christ and say, You know what? I'm done with you, Billy. Billy, I've had enough. Listen, if Christ were going to do that, He'd have done that a long time ago. Just saying. That's not Christ. Listen to this. John 10, 27 to 29 says, My sheep hear my voice. He says, I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Ever. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And then in John 3, 16, we can probably all quote this by memory, but listen, for God loved the world in this way. He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but will have eternal life. Will Jesus ever let you go? No, no, He won't. So, what does it say about our marriage? I'm sorry, let me change that. What does it say about Jesus? 
when we cut our marriages off. Let me go, let me go even a step further. Let me really step on some toes right now. Do you think that Jesus would ever speak in an angry, mean, and hateful way to you or to me? You know where I'm going with this, don't you? So what does it say about Jesus, husbands, when we act that way with our wives? Or what does it say about Jesus, wives, when you act that way towards your husband? You see, marriage is more important than you think. You see, marriage is about, it's about more than happiness. And it's about more than procreation. And it's about more than, than finding that person that, you know, guys, it's about more than finding that lady that has your rib in her. It's about more than all those things. Those are all important things. But it's deeper than that. Marriage is more important than you think. Now there's, I'm going to guess that there's kind of, there's three main groups of people in here. And again, this is kind of oversimplified. But I'm, there's three, three main groups in here, to, here today. First of all, there's some of you who are in here today who have been married for a long time and, and you've made it through some really, really hard times and you're thinking, well, we've already, we've already kind of gotten there. You know, we, have, we still have our problems, but we pretty much learned to just go to separate corners. You know, we just, we just figured this out. And you say, so what, is this, what does a series on marriage have to do with me? And here's what it is. Never underestimate God's ability to use you to impact other marriages. There are people in this church. There are people in your family. There are people in your neighborhood. There are, there are pe people all around you that if you've had a successful marriage, then you've got something to give. You've got something to share. In fact, as, as weekly as we, as we invite people, couples, to come up and, and kind of share and, and, and give a, a testimony about their marriages and, and their lives and how they get in there, I hope that can be super encouraging because I hope they're going to be able to give some testimony. Somebody out there is going to hear and say, wow, I've struggled with that. Maybe I need to talk to them. Maybe they can help me. But see, you can make a difference. There's people all around you who are struggling in their marriages. So don't count yourself out. We've been talking about being a, a multi-generational church. You know, how, you know how you become a multi-generational church that multiplies disciples? It's when, remember we talked about this last week, it's when older generations invest in younger generations. And I'm just going to tell you that I wish somebody would have preached this sermon to me when me and my wife first got married. I wish it would have gone down deep in me, the under, an understanding that if I just go to somebody and say, Hey, I heard you say this. Would, could I talk to you sometime? Never underestimate God's ability to use you to impact somebody else. Secondly, there's another, there's another group of people who are here today. And that's the group that would say, you know what, I'm not married yet. What does this series have to do with me? That's a great question. Number one, hopefully one day you'll get married. Especially two of you in here I'm thinking of especially. Just over Billy's head. He's, Are you talking to me? <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to embarrass you. Do hope they get married one day. One day you'll want to get married, right? One day God, God, and maybe you don't even want to get married, but who knows? Maybe one day you don't know what God's going to do in your life, and God will make you want to get married. Then seek God now. Learn to put these truths into your life now. 
so that when the time comes, you're ready. And by the way, don't go out looking for the right boy or the right girl or the right man or the right woman. Make God your number one. Make God the most important person the most important person in your life. When God is your number one, He will eventually show you your number two. So that's what you can do with it. Hear it, because God has a purpose, and God wants you to have a strong and a successful and a a healthy marriage. And then finally, there are those who are here today Who you may, maybe you feel that your marriage is just, just broken enough that you just don't know that it, can, that it can be fixed. Can I tell you that God has never run into a marriage that He didn't have a, a heal, uh, the ability to fix? God, God has never run into a situation that He didn't have what it took if both those people were committed to it to redeem. This, the same, by the way, goes true, goes true for us as individuals. For some of us here today, maybe we're thinking, you know, I've done too many bad things. I just don't see how God could ever save me. I don't see how He could ever fix what's broken in me. God has never run into a person that He didn't have the power to change. If they wanted to. But here's the thing, God never fixes anything that we don't want fixed. He never never works on anything that we don't want to be worked on. And so I, I know that there's there's there will be those of us who are in here who have marriages who are just who are hurting who are di- who we're going through hardships and we're going through struggles and difficulties and we come to church and we want to hide it because we really just don't want people to know. If I can just be a little bit transparent here, not too transparent, I promise. I'm not going to be that transparent, Ava, but 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 there's there's been Sundays as a pastor in my life where you'd probably be really surprised to know some of the things that I've had on my heart as I've had to preach because of struggles at home. Because that's, that's, part, that's part of life. It's part of growth. It's part of the process of, of fixing things that are broken. But here's the point. Marriage is more important than you think. It's not about our happiness. It's not, about, uh, it's not just about procreation. It's not just about having good, strong families. It, having strong marriages isn't even about building a strong church. You may not even be a, be a member at this church. You may not have any, any desire to, to have connection long term to this church. But if you can take something away to, to have a strong and a, and a strengthened, a stronger marriage here, then guess what? Great. Because marriage is more important than you think. So over these next few weeks... We're going to talk about how to fail-proof your marriage. We're going to talk about what a spirit-filled marriage looks like. And then at the end of it, starting on March 30th, we're going to have a, a marriage enrichment seminar. That, that, a, that a Christian counselor is going to come on Wednesday nights for six weeks and he's going to lead us through. So think through this for, for me for just a second. Because this, this is what your application is, is today. Your application is, number one, to take some of these notes and these truths that I've shared with you and just, just think through those, ponder those. Ask God to, to impact your life with them, to change your heart with them. But here's the, other, the, the second part of the application. is to, If, if at all possible, make every, uh, every opportunity that you can to be here for the next five weeks. And to invite others that you know to be here for the next five weeks. Because for the next five weeks, we're just going to build on top, uh, on top of one another. We're going we're to see what it takes to build a strong marriage. 
a Christ-like marriage. And then the third part is for you to begin considering signing up for this marriage enrichment seminar at the end of March. It could be every single one of us, every single couple in this room. It could be, it could be two or three couples in this room. Either, either way, I'm, I'm going to be excited. But, but be prepared to sign up for that. Why, Billy? Because marriage is more important than you think. Let's pray, okay? Heavenly